right, welcome to the latest episode of the Online Warriors podcast. I am Illegal86, one of your hosts, and as always, I am joined by Nerd Bomber and Tactic, who are over there in the virtual room that we have set up. We're at, we're at separate corners of the room. Hello, hello, everybody. How's it going? Hello. I mean, I'm doing good. I don't know how everybody else is doing, but uh, we also have a fourth person who's about to be in the last corner of our virtual room, a very special guest today that I am super, super excited about. We'll get to him in a minute. We have an extended interview with him that we think you'll enjoy. We, in general, have a very very film-centric lineup of news today. We're going to be we're going to be sticking to Hollywood for the most part. And this guest that I mentioned kind of feeds into that. So we're going to be talking with Greg Edmondson here in a, in a minute. But I do want to just quick preview. We're also going to be talking, of course, about the HBO Max news, which is huge. We're going to be talking about Heart of Stone, this, this newly announced Gal Gadot spy thriller that's just been announced. And this Metal Gear Solid movie news, Solid Snake has been cast. And we'll get to that as well. But for now, we are going to step aside and cut into our interview with Greg Edmondson, who we had an absolute blast chatting with. Thanks again to him. We'll turn it over there now. Enjoy. All right. So today we have a super special guest joining us on the show. He's the man responsible for the epic scores behind some of your favorite series and some of our favorite series, uh, the Uncharted video game series, Firefly, which a lot of people think had too short of a span on television. And he's also a two-time BAFTA award winner. This is music composer Greg Edmondson. Greg, welcome to the Online Warriors podcast. It's a thrill to have you here. Honored to be here and quite looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I was I was just telling you before we started in here, you know, a lot of people right now are talking about their Spotify raps, they're getting back. How, how do they listen to music throughout the entire year? My entire basically summary of that was movie scores and video game scores. So for me, for someone who has a serious love of the genre, it's, it's, it's a huge thrill for me to have you here. And it's a huge thrill for all of us. So, you know, we, we can dive right in. And I guess you can just tell us a little bit about how you quote unquote broke into the industry, whether you had an educational background in this, uh, what that looked like, and what got you started with film and video game scoring. I did have a background in this. When I moved to, I moved to uh, Los Angeles from Dallas, Texas, because this industry at that point in time didn't exist in Dallas, Texas. Really, Los Angeles was the only place that existed. So I moved here, and first I was working as a guitar player, a studio guitar player, just kind of you know playing on other people's projects. But <laughs> early on, I had an opportunity to uh, work for a company called Hanna-Barbera. They did a lot of animation. Of course I know (laughs) Hanna-Barbera. Yeah. And so that was my first gig was Hanna-Barbera. I didn't stay there very long. I ended up working with a guy named Mike Post who was really big in television. And he invited me to come over and start working on TV shows. And I did. So even though I had a, a background in music, I then had to study privately which I did for years in Los Angeles, because film and TV and video game scoring is now a big deal. And, and you know, colleges and universities have classes that you can take and they have programs, but they didn't at that point in time. So everything you learned was pretty much classically oriented. Well, right. you know, film and TV and video games mix all the genres together so right. it was kind of a learn as you go thing. And, and people gave me the opportunity to learn while I was doing. And how lucky is that? Right. I, I mean, one of the things, you know, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but I have to imagine, you know, having a, a background in classical composition, there's still a lot you have to learn to do film and video game scoring, because I think probably one of the finer points of that is knowing when your score needs to, you know, get out of the way for dialogue and you still want to be present, but you don't want to be overbearing. So there's probably a lot like that that I imagine goes into it, but you're the expert, not me. Then again. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, classical scoring is meant for let's just call it, let's say the concert hall. So you try to make everybody's part completely interesting all the time. I mean, that would be the ideal thing. But but you're absolutely right. In film or TV, if dialogue is going on, you're just a part of the storytelling team. So you're surrounded by, hopefully, great actors, a great script, great lighting. And it's a, it's a whole bunch of people together telling a story rather than just music being the story in and of itself. So, you know, legit writing is concert writing, but writing for film and TV is being a part of the storytelling process with other people who have a completely different discipline than you. And But hopefully they're great at what they do, and you just want to all come together and make the story be the most important thing. 
Right. That also resonates with me, you know, especially we're going to talk about Uncharted, of course, but Uncharted as a video game experience is very story driven. And, you know, while you are this treasure hunter, it's kind of bombing around. There's an emotional core to it. And your music, among other things, provides that emotional core. And like you said, I have to imagine it's a collaborative experience. So that's that's super cool to hear. By the Uh, way, that was Uncharted was a joy to work on. And the reason that that game had heart, at least this this is my opinion, it was created by a woman named Amy Hennig. Mm -hmm. And early on, you know, we'll get into the details early, but early on, she told me, I'm not making games for teenage boys, not because there's anything wrong with that. It's just because they've got a whole bunch of games already. So she said, I want to make a game that can draw people in who maybe weren't interested in gaming or didn't know they were. And so I'm going to start by writing a really good script and try to make characters that people care about. Right. And she did. Uh, Yeah, I'll say. I was going to say. I mean, it's a unique experience, you know, as a game. And yeah, we we will talk about it. But, you know, just that's interesting to hear. And that's something that I have to admit I didn't know, even as a fan of the franchise. But you make a good point that it's you know, teenage boys, they, they have so many options for games, right? But you want to try to make something that's more all-encompassing than that. Yeah, that's what she was trying to do. Right. You know, only because every, I mean, by the way, it was in no way disparaging towards teenage boys. She was just going, they've already got a bunch of them and a bunch more coming. I just want to draw people in. And the key to that for her was creating characters that people cared about because she was the writer and the game director as well. And a lot of times that's not the case. You have a writer and then a game director, same as you do on a film. You know, right. you have the screenwriter, but then somebody else directs it and tells the story that they perceived out of the script. So because she she was everything, she had control over everything. So she knew exactly the story she was trying to tell. She tried to cast it with people who could make that story come to life. Uncharted happened after the demise of Firefly. And if you look at Firefly and you enjoyed it, there are similarities between Nathan Drake and Mal Reynolds. Well, so that's interesting, too, because a lot of people think that, you know, if Uncharted, well, Uncharted is now getting a film franchise, but a lot of people were lobbying for years for Nathan Fillion to play Nathan Drake. So I can totally see the parallels. There were some parallels. They were both flawed human beings who would sometimes say and do the wrong thing, but in the long run, they were always going to do the right thing. And that's just like, that's who we are as human beings. You know, that's our experience. That's what we do. We do the wrong thing. And we just hope that in the long run, we end up doing the right thing. So it's goofy, but there were parallels between those two characters. So it was an easy transition writing for one and moving over to the other. I mean, I feel like too, that development in video games and bringing that kind of heart and story and real life characters like you were talking about to life is kind of what's made the video game industry a little bit more mainstream and have such a wide appeal. I mean, we've seen the growth of the industry in the last 10, 20 years. And I think a lot of that is just the storytelling and the great characters and heart that those kind of games like Uncharted are really bringing to the industry. Once somebody raises the bar, and by the way, this is going on in television now. This is a great time for television. There are so many great shows. And because the bar has been raised... Everybody has to rise to the occasion, so they can't just put out a show. It has to look good. It has to sound good. And the fact that they're making 10 episodes a year, thank you, Game of Thrones, instead of, (laughs) you know, when I first started, uh, a TV season was 26 shows. That's a lot. By the time you do 26 shows, you are worn out. And everybody working on the show is worn out. That's just a lot because TV shows come so fast and furious. You finish one and they go, okay, we got to start on the next one this afternoon because, you know, it goes on the air next Friday. Oh, God, okay. The, now TV show, the TV series are, at least on network TV, are about 22 episodes a year. But all the ones on Netflix and everywhere else – are about 10 episodes a year. So it's great for writers. Instead of just having to crank it out and say, we got to make 22 shows, they go, let's make 10, but let's make every one of them really good. So that raises the bar. And the same thing has happened in video games. And Uncharted was, was a big part, I believe, of starting to raise that bar so that people were telling stories worth telling, stories that you could remember, and creating characters that people cared about. Once the bar gets raised, everybody else sees that, and they kind of go, well, we're going to have to do that in our in our next iteration or our next game. 
we're going to have to do that exact same thing. So the competition, and it's friendly competition, just makes makes it better for everybody. And the, the ultimate recipient is the person playing the game. The gamer is who everybody cares about. How can we make, make this experience great for them? So that's kind of how that happens. Right. I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't agree. You hear a lot, right, about like, we used to be playing Space Invaders where if there was a story, it was not really a story at all. And to see how far we've come, and I, I think I completely agree with you that Uncharted was a huge stepping stone there in that it became this... I mean, Uncharted has this like extremely cinematic quality, right? And and again, you're, you're contributing to that. And it's just, it's been so cool to see. And like you said, other people see that and see how successful that franchise has been and said, okay, let's try and emulate that in terms of at least its best aspects, which are, you know, which is the storytelling quality. I, I one, one question I had, I guess, in the course of some of the things you just said, you know, in terms of TV, and I, I you know, we can use Firefly as a proxy or other projects you've worked on there. But when you are recording a score for an entire season's worth of television. Do you do that all at once? Or is it a weekly grind much like I would imagine the writer's room is? For me, it's always been a weekly thing. You're not creating a library. You're literally just scoring every second of the show so that you can be emotionally there for every second of the show. There are some TV shows on cable where they create a library and then just toss the library in. It's not really effective scoring, right? but it's putting music that at least all came from the same place into a show. In a perfect world, the composer wants to write music to the picture because, you know, when there's something interesting going on, it moves and it shifts and you have to be there and the music has to move and shift with the story. So for, at least in, in, in my journey, Everything has been you you score every second of every show. Right. And that practice, I would imagine, starts, you know, you you get the script and you read it. Or are you literally getting the cut of the show that doesn't have any music in it? And they come to you and say, "Okay, we need scoring for this. It it might be a little bit of both might be one or the other. Television is so crazy. Everything you said happens at the beginning of the season. And then after about episode three, it doesn't happen anymore because everybody's just too busy. If they send you a script, you don't read it. If they send you a rough cut of the show, it doesn't matter because it's going to change. Right. It's when they send you the final cut of the show that you look at it and you start and, and you soak it all in and then you start writing because now anything you write might be a keeper because the show's not going to change, hopefully. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes I would look at the rough cut. They always make a rough cut because I have to show the network the rough cut of the show. But you don't always see it because you're pretty much busy working on last week's episode still. You know, music and post-production are the guys at the very end of the line. The screenwriters have to create everything before the first day of filming. So all through the whole process, whenever anybody runs behind, it comes out of your time. Right. Now, so sometimes and, they come to you and they go, hey, listen, we only have three days, but it still has to air on Friday. So and, and I, would, I would probably imagine, right, that I don't know that video game scoring works the same way, but I imagine that in that framework you just laid out for television, that puts you directly in the line of fire in terms of deadlines. Right. So that had to be a lot of stress for you relative to maybe the video game schedule where you have this game and yes, you still have deadlines. But I don't know if you are the person that is kind of in the pole position there that is going to be taking the heat. Are you last in line in that process as well? No, no, no. That's a completely different process. Right. Television is, of course, governed by the schedule. If your show airs on Friday, then you got to have it finished on Thursday, you know? So that's just a given, you know, it's what you signed up for and how, you know, however you, whatever you have to do to make that happen, you do. Video games are a completely different animal and it's changing. You know, they used to crank out sequels, you know, iterations really quickly. They don't do that so much anymore. Sometimes it's four years, you know, between another Call of Duty or, or Uncharted. So you have lots of time to write. And it's a completely separate, it's a completely different kind of writing in one way. And, and then of course it's not in another way, but you have time on video games. You have time to think about things, to try things, to experiment, to see what's working. And, uh, it's a much more leisurely process. Once you get close to an orchestra session and for uncharted, we, we did, uh, 
we recorded twice at uh, George Lucas's facility. It's called Skywalker Ranch in Marin mm-hmm. County. And the third one we did at Abbey Road in London. And and once you get close to the orchestra session, now all the pressure's on because every note has to be perfect because you really can't waste time with an orchestra fixing mistakes. They all have to be fixed, and that's on your team to make it be perfect. And, you know, I'm surrounded by great people and people who cover my many mistakes and make them all be okay. And, you know, the whole thing is just a team effort. But right. that, that that's the pressure in a, in, in a video game is getting ready for the big session. Because that's mm-hmm. a lot of, you know, in TV, when I used to do recording sessions with live players, I would have at the most three hours at Fox or Warner Brothers or Sony. And you had three hours and you did the show. And thank you very much. On a video game at all those places, Skywalker twice and, and Abbey Road, you had the orchestra for a week. Oh, right. what a what a luxury. What a joy <laughs> right. to be doing double sessions every day for a week. Fantastic. So, right. you know, that's another difference. And that's why get, getting ready for a whole week of double sessions is a huge deal. That That's a lot of prep. But before, you know, until that, but, you know, so let's crunch that into three or four weeks of a four year span. Well, there you go. That still leaves you uh, three years plus of being able to think about things and do stuff and go back and look at it and see what you would change and, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it does not get easier schedule wise than writing for video games. Film is like TV. It's a little more elongated because you don't have another one coming after. Right. But it's still everything that happens in the process that runs late each time out of your time. Mm-hmm. Right. And th- th- that's just the nature of the business and that's how it works. So a- every composer in town has people who, if it's more than humanly possible, you can just hand it off to them and say, look, do it. Do some. We've worked together for years. Do this like I would do it. Here are some thematic devices that I'm using using and everybody has people that can help fill in for them because you know if there's a release date on the film and it's not going to be moved then there you go in this right. era of covid release dates are getting moved like crazy i think they've moved james bond four or five times at this point exactly yeah. if, you know it's more than a year for you know off of its original release and they're doing that because why release a film that it, you know if people can't go to the theater right so i totally get it but apart from you know before that we Release dates really didn't get moved unless it was an absolute disaster that could not be fixed. Right. Unless you needed rewrites or some, something. So something, something you know, the studio looked at it and said, we put so much money into this film and, and we don't like it. We don't think it's going to go. We don't think it's going to work. We've got to do some fixes or we got to do something to keep the money coming in. Right. So that's one of the few reasons they would never say, you know what? This is going to put the composer under terrible pressure. Let's just move the release date. They went, that thought would never <laughs> right. occur to them. Right. Not in a million years. They would probably, we just say I'll get another composer if this composer can't. can't yeah, hack it. Exa- that, yeah, exactly. Right. It's, the studio it's, studios think weird ways. Here's just a little bit of Hollywood history for you. You know the studio 20th Century Fox. Right? Yes. <laughs> right. There's a uh, right next door. If you've ever been to Los Angeles, there is a huge complex of land where every high-end attorney, it's all high-rise buildings now, every high-end attorney, high-end everything has offices in Century City. Well, the reason it's called Century City is because 20th Century Fox went so over budget on a movie called Cleopatra. Oh, right. Yeah. Elizabeth Taylor. Yes. That they said, we need to sell some of our property. <laughs> To compensate for the money. So they sold this land for, who knows, maybe a couple of million bucks. And now it's worth billions and billions of dollars. Right. It was the worst business decision ever made. <laughs> But they needed but they to, were trying to, to, to keep the books books. looking good. So they that right. that's that's why you have the century in both names. Century City, twentieth century Fox. There you right. go. Little Hollywood story there. So I'm glad you brought up uh, a little while back, you brought up the recording process and the, specifically the live recording process. And, you know, in terms of television, I guess, first, you know, I imagine maybe I'm wrong, but when you're recording this, is there a big screen where you're watching what's actually happening to get the beats right, to get any any holes you have in the music to time them right? Or is that more intuition based? And I guess I would also ask the same question about video games. Are you watching anything for video games or is that more they'll cut it in where they need it? Two completely different things. When you're scoring television, 
almost everything, probably 98% of it is done to a click. Right. So, so you have a click. Let's just say it's uh, at 120 for whatever reason. So when you write it, you're hearing ding, 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 right, ding, right. ding, and you write it to the click. You write it, and then you use your samples to create a rough and to take a look at it and say, is this working to picture? Thank goodness, technology, just like it enables you guys to be in different cities, enables music guys to say, well, this is not going to sound like as good as real strings or real brass, but I can put it all in and watch it against the picture and see how it's working. So you write it to a click. And when you go to the session, yes, you do see it on the big screen, but the timing is already set. Everything is already done. You record it to a click. The click is locked to picture. So it should be, unless something has gone wrong, exactly what you did. And that's, that's how it goes exactly with the picture. Video games, what I saw mostly on Uncharted was little stick figures running around <laughs> in a jungle. And, and, you know, they would send you what they call concept art, which is what they think it might look like at the end. Right. But just like you're making changes, they make changes all the time. Right. And at least the way Naughty Dog worked, it only came together at the very end. And then all of a sudden, every day they would drop in a new layer and you go, oh, that is so cool. I wish I'd known this before. <laughs> right, right. But you didn't. And uh, it just is what it is. And because in, in video games, in TV, you, you do the music and it gets dropped in really quickly. Mm-hmm. In video games, you have to do the music and then leave months for putting the music into the game. Right. So you record. If you've got four years to do it, you may do the music sometime in year three so that you have all this time to put the music in. Because, it, you know, in video games, your contract is usually for about two hours worth of music. But that two hours has to somehow fill up 10 to 14 hours of game time, depending on how right. someone plays. So sometimes they will separate. You know, when you record, you will separate stuff. Like, I'll just give you an example. Say we're at Abbey Road and we have the uh, strings and the brass all together in the same room. You rehearse the piece and then you say, okay, brass, everybody sit out and let's just record the low strings, the cello and the basses. So everybody knows what they're supposed to do, but you just record the cello and the basses. Right. Then you record the violas and the violins. Okay, thank you. Then you record maybe just the French horns, then maybe the trumpets. And when you put it all together, it sounds exactly like when you rehearsed it, hopefully. Right. But when they're putting the music into the game, they have ways of just starting off with, let's say, just the low strings and then adding in other pieces so that it built, but it's all of a piece, if that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. And this is another thing that I was going to ask about is, you know, there have been a lot of studies done and, and people often talk about like if you're working at an office or something and you want music on in the background, but you want to remain focused. That's one of the designing principles of video games, maybe even more so than than movies, right? Because movies are this passive experience where you're watching it. But in video games, you're doing something and you want music, you want it for that emotional color and you want it to really immerse you, but you also don't want it to be too distracting. So I, I guess, you know, maybe they're layering it based on that, maybe in a certain section of the game they want you really wired in so they don't want the music to to get in the way of that but i guess a a, a sub question would be how much would you say that sort of thing influenced your work on with with uncharted and with with naughty dog this will be an elongated answer but bear with me one thing (laughs) i did when i first took uncharted i had never done a video game i didn't have any experience in that did you play video games though no okay interesting no i mean i do now but i'm awful you know i die every every (laughs) five minutes we we all die it's okay (laughs) (laughs) so i didn't i you know i was unsure of whether or not i should even take the gig because i you know i wanted them to get what they deserve but i i went down uh to santa monica and met with amy and met with them and i and i really liked them and they were you know they said listen you just do what you do and we'll make it work and I said, well, if, if you can do that, then I will learn as I go and I will learn quickly what's working for you and what's right. not. That one we had to do fairly quickly because they had waited really longer than you should to hire a composer and, and get mm-hmm. working. Okay. So anyway, one thing I did that was not by design, it's just every piece I would write. So let's say I was writing a piece that was three, three and a half minutes long. 
I would write for 30 or 45 seconds, and then I would build a, some sort of mu- musical conclusion. Let's just say you were writing, and then so you had everybody building up, start up again. So I would leave right. a little space, before, you know, I mean, you know, a second, two seconds before I started up again. What happened on Uncharted 1 is when the music started up again, it would serendipitously catch some event and the players were calling Sony going, how did you do that? How did you make the music fit the game? So it went right with me. And they said, we had to tell them we didn't. And if you play the game again, that won't happen again. It was a serendipitous occurrence that right. <laughs> it was just the luck of the draw. Yeah. But that was, you know, I, I asked Sony, I said, should I change that? And I said, Oh God, no, keep doing it because it makes the player feel like the music is going with them on this journey. Right. If they play it again, it won't be in the same place, but it'll be someplace different. It'll just, it'll work. Exactly. And and if you leave those catches in there, there's a chance, there's always a chance, right, that it'll hit at that exact right time where... There's always a chance. So anyway, right. that was just a, a, a discovery thing. In putting the music into the game, and this is why video games are such a team sport, Sony, the Sony guys were just great. And they were all great players. Mm -hmm. And so they would put the music into the game. And it turned out sometimes that music that I wrote for one place in the game ended up working better somewhere else. Right. And if so, that's fine. I mean, the only rule was make it be fun for the gamer, the person playing the game. Make it be great for them. That's all anybody cared about. And the Sony guys were so good at this. And they spent months sitting in the theater at Naughty Dog, putting music into the game and programming it so that it would start here and and this would start here and this would change this. You know, I was just busy writing music. They were busy taking what I wrote, making it work. Right. So So we all did it together. And when you think about it, I mean, all I am is the guy who scribbles stuff on paper. It's the orchestra that brings it to life. I mean, they all look at it and say, oh, yeah. And then they they make it be something even more than what it looked like on paper. And they make it be beautiful, hopefully, and something with emotion to it. And, and there's something unique within an orchestra about 80 to 100 people all focused on one thing in one room at the same time. Right. There's just an energy there that is unique. Well, what, what I've heard it described as by other composers is, you know, you, you write this music, right? And and it sounds good. And, you know, you have your first cut that you were talking about where you're just doing it to a click. And then you get the orchestra in the room and you record it. And I, the way I've heard it described is it's like watching a child be born. You know, it's it's this completely different experience and, and they add so much to it. I was just kind of wondering, I'm one of those people where I really like to get in the head and like understand the creative process. And especially talking about how, obviously, you, you have something on paper and then the orchestra brings it to life. How did you even get to the the point where you have something on paper? Like, what is kind of the first step in your process? Do you start with a specific instrument or like a beat or a melody in your head? And like, do you start with like a, a script or a moment in the game or something? Or does it just kind of like, how does it come to you? I guess I'm kind of wondering. Well, games on TV are very different. So I'll start with TV. Once you get a final cut of the picture, you watch it, and then you hopefully you've you've sat down with the uh, in TV. You would sit down with the uh, producers of the show. Producers have all the power in TV. Writers mm-hmm. and you know it's, it, the director has all the power in film. But you sit down with the producers on the show because the, you don't you don't sit down with the director because the director just comes in, directs an episode, and then leaves. The producers are the ones who know what works for the franchise. So you watch the picture, and the first thing you kind of have to say is, what's the story they're telling here, and what is the tempo of it? What does it feel like to me? And so you start kind of with the tempo, and then mm-hmm. you say, now what's important in this scene? This happens. I'm just making making something up. He pulls his gun. Right. Okay, got it. And then it just sits there for a while, but then this changes. So you go, that's a signpost. So I got to mark out the signpost that I want to be sure and have the music change when this happens. And then you just write music from point A to your signpost. And then you kind of go now from this signpost to the next one, it has changed. See, that's why scoring a scene specifically is going to play one way that you can never do with library music. 
when right. you just created a bunch right. of music because you're not going to catch any of those things. It's it's not reactive. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're not going to catch any. In other words, you just have music that just kind of flows underneath, and there you go. Uh, but if it's really scored, then the music's going to go with the thing. You don't want to catch too much. You just want to catch the really important parts. And it doesn't have to be a big change. Maybe just another instrument comes in. Maybe it goes to high strings. Maybe low strings come in. You know, a lot of possibilities. And that's how you would score to TV. In a video game, you have freedom that you don't have in TV because when you're writing the music, there is no dialogue, really. Mm-hmm. You right. know, I mean, let's just say you're uh, doing some of the some of the platform things that happen in video games, running, jumping, whatever, you know, all I ever had from Nathan, not Nathan Fillion, but Nathan, Nathan Drake. Drake. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was, oh, uh, oh, uh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. Grunts and, you know, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> oh, you know, that, that, right. that kind of stuff. So you could write these long pieces and because you weren't bumping against dialogue, you could write all sorts of melodic gestures, right. big grand melodic things that you could never get away with in television or film because in order to get away with it in television or film, you'd have to have a scene where nothing was, you know, the only thing that was being featured was the music. Right, right. So it's, it's just a different animal. And I don't, I can't, you know, I would always talk with Amy and say, what is it that you want this to say? And I knew that I was getting it from from the right source because she was the one who wrote it. She was the one who per, was producing it. So she right. knew exactly what she was trying to accomplish. And she gave me insight. And then I was free just 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 to write. So kind of honing in on getting started, obviously, like that developed into a, a franchise. When you signed on for the game, did you know that it was going to turn into a franchise? Did you think it was just like a, a single game? And when it did turn into a franchise, how did you kind of bring a fresh perspective to each game while still kind of maintaining the same undercurrents of the series and the tone of the games, I guess. Well, we knew what the thematic device was, but one of the things that was fun about Uncharted is they were always in a different environment, at least in the three that I did. Right. Uh, and men in number four. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen number four. The first one was in a jungle. So the sounds in a jungle are kind of closed in a little claustrophobic because you're inside something. You're inside a jungle. It had lots of ethnic flutes, and it was not big in a cinematic way because that wasn't what you were looking at. You were looking at something closed in. Right. The second one was Tibet, Mongolia, completely different animal. Starts off in a completely different way. Wide right. open cinematic panoramas, wide open as far as the eye could see, maybe in any direction. You know, even his uh, hanging off the train, which, right. which by the way, got reproduced in uh, Fast and Furious, I think. Was it Fast and Furious? I can't remember. I, I, I know what movie you're reaching for, but I can't think of it either. Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> the, scene, the scene was recreated, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And by the way, no reason not to. It was, it was a thrilling scene. Oh, it was an unbelievable start to that game. I'll never forget the start of that. It was a fantastic start. So you look at where you are. In in the jungle, I got to use lots of cool ethnic flutes. And, you know, I love doing that. But, it, it, you know, in the second one, we got to use all these Tibetan temple horns and, you know, all this stuff that was... I love ethnic instruments. I kind of got into that. Josh Sweden got me into that on Firefly, okay, yeah. where you would take ethnic instruments and just mix them in with, let's just call it you know, Western-style orchestra. His reasoning was different. His reasoning was, in his post-apocalyptic world, all the cultures were thrown together. Right. And right. You, you could use Chinese vocals. And by the way, they used Chinese, uh, you know, because he couldn't use curse words on television. Right, yeah. He, he just said, what is it in Chinese? Say that. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, they yeah. also did that with some of the text on the ships, too. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of it's coming out in instrumentation. But I guess to to break it down to the theme in Uncharted that everybody knows, right? The the, the French horn driven the main theme of the game, which persisted through obviously all four of them. I I guess, is there a story that you remember coming up with that? Did that just kind of come to you? Was it inspired by another piece of music? You know, because that's the thing that everybody knows, right? It's, It's a huge deal. I'll tell you the actual truth on this. This will be disappointing. I wrote that piece just because, number one, they gave me the freedom just to write anything. Right. I didn't write it with any any place specifically in mind. 
Amy in, and Naughty Dog and Sony, in their graciousness to me, said, let's just record everything you write. We have no idea what, you know, how it's all going to fit together, but let's just record it. So we recorded what people know as Nate's theme. We had no idea where to use it in the game. We couldn't figure out where. Wow, so you didn't know that was the title. See, that's, first of all, it's not a disappointing answer at all. That's a fascinating answer. <laughs> so it, it's the absolute truth. And then all of a sudden, somebody said, you know, we've got this thing when the game first boots up, and we don't have any music for that. Why don't right. we toss that in there and see how it works? And Tossed it, it in was, and they loved it. Yeah, it, it, it became iconic. <laughs> it did. It did. Remember I talked about serendipitous occurrences? Right. This was one for us. I wrote another piece in the second game. There's a character named Schaefer, and he, he dies. And I wrote this kind of emotional piece of music using the Arhu, which is kind of this primitive Chinese violin. Mm -hmm. and, and Karen Han came and played it. She's the star of the Arhu. She works for John Williams and everybody else. If you need an Arhu, Karen is the one you call. And it was just a real emotional piece. But we didn't have a place for it. And somebody called me one day. At the end of, of the games, after they've done the gameplay, they do what they call the cinematics or cut scenes, which are more like scoring film or television because right. you, know, you have dialogue and it goes from point A to point B, and the player's not in control there. So that's something that the player needs to watch because it forwards the story to the next mm -hmm. gameplay. And Jonathan said, you know what? We, we're going to need a piece of music for when Schaefer dies. And I watched it, and I said, you know that piece of music we can't find a place for? Put it in there. Right. And it, it just fit. Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> it just fit. And that was just another thing that was just, you know, just an occurrence. And it's just one of the joys of letting, you know, people saying, if you were inspired enough to write this, then let's just record it. And even if we can't find a place for it, we'll just have a good version of it. But you hate to do that because you want every, all the money that you spend to go into the game. Right. Right. And we never came away with something that we didn't use somewhere in the game. So that's one of the tricks of, uh, you know, you have to book the orchestra when you're working for a week. You have to book them for a certain amount of time. What you don't want to do is leave music on the stand, which means you didn't get everything done. Right. That's a problem. But you also don't want to get finished early and say, well, we don't have any more music and, you know, they're already paid through Friday. You want to try and time it so just about the time you get done, you go, you know, we got 10 minutes left. Well, that's really hard to plan for that. I was going to say, it has to be incredibly difficult to do. <laughs> you, you plan for it as best you can. You try to keep an eye on where you are in the process, and then you just try to make it work out. You try to adjust as you go and say, boy, we need to do it. We're falling behind. Let's do a couple of music pieces that we probably don't even have to rehearse. If the players would just read it, it'll be fine. And then you do that, and by the the, the players can always just read it right on the spot. They're so right. utterly amazing. It's just, oh, what a joy to work with great players. What an absolute joy. So you try to keep track of it and make it work out, but, you know, it is tricky. Yeah. Well, so I want to talk about Firefly a little bit. We talked about Uncharted a lot. Firefly, it's, it's whole shtick, right, is it's a space western. And that comes through perhaps more than anywhere, you know, in the music, the instrumentation, and you already talked about it, it's a, it's a blend of a lot of different cultures, but I would say predominantly it's a mix of this orchestral sci-fi thing, and you have these this Western instrumentation in it as well. So was that a design constraint that you were given from the top? Did, did Joss Whedon say to you, because it sounds like you've spoken to Josh Whedon, which by the way, you know, blows my mind, or talking to someone who talked to Joss Whedon, but was that kind of the main direction you got, or was it more of just we're blending every culture we can together in, in what you're going to do here. No, early on, again, before a show starts, everybody talks about what it should be. And you, you have time. Once, once a show starts, nobody has really much time to talk about anything because you're just right. in the uh, throes of production, you know, which takes everybody's time. I'll tell you in, in, in a little bit how I got hired on that gig. It's, it's a crazy story. But Josh did say, he said, when we're in space, the last thing I want is French horns going, ba -ba, ba -ba, you know, right. Because Star Trek, you know, has already got that completely covered. He wanted the mold to be broken. Well, yeah, let's do something different. So right. let's do fiddle and dobro and, you know, use colors because the story we were telling 
was not about the grandeur of space. It was about these nine people, this little ragtag group of guys surviving in the midst of, of this crazy universe. Right. And so it was a smaller story, but that was a story that mattered was a smaller story. Josh didn't think of it as a Western as much as he thought of it this way. It was a post-apocalyptic world where everything was governed by your resources. And it, right. it, it goes back even to the history of our country. If uh, you were staking a claim in Missouri, then your life was completely different than if you were a Rockefeller living in New York and money was no object. Mm -hmm. Two completely different things. And that's why in Joss's world, you could have laser guns or pistols like in the Old West. It all made sense depending on your resources in this post-apocalyptic world. And that made sense to me because the cultures were all thrown together. At any point in time, you could throw in ethnic instrumentation and that was fine. And it didn't have to make any sense because all the cultures were thrown together. But if, if you were in uh, six shooter land, that was going to be different than if you were in laser gun land. So it was just what he had done. He had created the perfect show. And I had done enough television to know that it was perfect because he had nine main characters with these wildly divergent past. So he could tell stories that could go in all these different directions, and he could go on forever without repeating the same story. Most TV shows have a central conceit, if, if shall we call it. And it's just the same thing week after week. They just change the costumes or change the cars, but it's really the same the same thing. So you had mentioned how great Firefly was. And I also like the fact that the music scores needed to be absolutely unique, yet they recycled the troopers' uniforms in that show. But that said, were you surprised when the show was canceled because of how good it was? Oh, I was shocked. In fact, I cried like a child. I, I mean, it's, you know... I a lot of people, and I, I tend to agree, and I'm guessing you do, I mean, people think it was ahead of its time. I mean, also, if I remember correctly, the network aired episodes out of order, which you're setting it up to fail at that point. It just, I mean, if, if I was you, I would Box was truly the shot. bad guy in this situation. It seems that way. <laughs> okay, I'll tell, I, I'll, I'll tell you my version of that story. <laughs> okay, I love that. First, I'll tell you how I got hired, and then I'll continue on. Right. Everybody knew Joss was doing this new show. And this was back before MP3s. So they said he wouldn't take calls from anybody's agent because he just wouldn't. So they said, just send in a CD. And if we're interested, we'll get back to you. Well, I mean, this is Los Angeles. So about the time your CD hit the bottom of the mail bin, you'd already moved on. You weren't going to go home and wait for the phone to ring. Right. Mm -hmm. But one day the phone rang. And they said, this is Joss Whedon's office. Would you be interested in talking to Joss about this new show? And I said, oh, absolutely. And they said, can you come down to Fox tomorrow and let's talk about it? I said, absolutely. Hung up the phone and I said, I am so screwed. I've never seen an episode of Buffy or Angel. <laughs> and he's going to say, what'd you like? And I'm just going to have to say, oh, there's so much. I can't even narrow it down to one. <laughs> That's what you say when you see a really bad film and you see the director, you go, yeah, I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> how, to, how to save face in Hollywood. But I went down and they said, so you, you, this will be a five minute meeting. And Joss and I just started talking about different stuff. And then we started arguing about guitar players. He was going, so this Jeff Beck tune is the best tune he's ever done. And I said, no, that's a good tune, but this tune is an even better tune. And he says, you are so full of shit. I said, no, sir, you are full of shit. And I, the, we, we were just having fun. And so our five-minute meeting lasted two hours. And uh, at the end, he just said, call your agent and tell him you got the gig. And I said, Wow. And so I walked out and in his office, I saw a wall of CDs and it was, I said, Oh, I know that guy. He's great. And I know her. She's better than the other three guys put together. I have no idea how in the world they picked my CD out of that wall of great music. But every now and then miracles happen. So there you go. So on to the show in Fox, Joss had made a two hour pilot. It was a $10 million pilot. That's a lot of money for a TV right. pilot. Yeah. That's film type money. Fox looked at it and said, we're not showing it. They always hated this show. It just wasn't what they wanted. You know, even the main title that Joss wrote, his right. vision, well, what Fox wanted was an action show. 
They wanted right. nonstop action with a little bit of talking. And by the way, that's what they replaced it with. I, I, I think it was a show called Fast Lane or something, you know, two guys in a car. Great. <laughs> <laughs> same old, same old, same old, right? Yeah, exactly. What Joss wanted to do was create a show that had moral conundrums and people str- and, and people did the wrong thing, but then ultimately did the right thing. Just like when Jane sold out River in, uh, I think it was Ariel was the name of the, but, but, but then at the end, what you you know, Mal locks him in the airlock, and he doesn't want ever he doesn't want people to know what he did. And I love that Mal could never tell Anara that he loved her, but he right. did. But he he just could never say it. And I really wanted to know where that story was going. And Josh, uh, you know, Please. I told him, I said I really want to know. And he said, Well, I know. You know, well, great. That doesn't help me. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. He didn't tell me. I even read that Fox was against that relationship potentially evolving as well. So it's just, it's been a lot of controversy that this show had to deal with when it first came out. And I agree with what you said earlier, that it was truly ahead of its time. Fox just hated it. And what we never could figure out is why did they pick it up then? You know, why didn't they just go to Joss and say, you know what, this is not the show for us, but we wish you great luck. We hope to work in the future. That would have been the right thing to do. Instead, they did all the things that you talked about. They aired them out of order. They went to Joss and said, we're not showing the two-hour pilot, so write another episode. And he said, I can't introduce nine main characters in an hour. Right, right. So I can't give people the arc of the show without everybody knowing why these people are together. They all they start off not being together. And right. then they come together, and we have to know why. And Fox said, we don't care. We're not showing it. That's just so hard to fathom. <laughs> I just, I it can't. really is. It really is. Well, by the, here's the way TV works. When everything used to go on the air in September, which Firefly did, you start shooting in J- July. So even though Fox was saying, we're not going to air the two-hour pilot, you'd already shot a lot of several episodes. You couldn't make wholesale changes. You could make little changes. Right, right. You can't go back and reshoot them. There's neither the time nor the money. So everybody tried to address it and say, you know, Fox just seems to hate it. What can we do to make it better for them? Because if we get to the second part of the season, and every TV show is this way, you get to the second part of the season and everybody sees what was working. Now they can write the things that really, really work. And then when you get to season two, it's a completely different animal and it should be running. It should be firing on all cylinders by the beginning of season two. Right. Firefly never got that chance, and it just never got that chance. And yet it still was even good right out of the gate. It was good right out of the box, but I knew what it could be, and I knew what he intended it to be. Right. The thing that I loved about Firefly, some of the bad guys I could live without, but the, the main, the crew, those nine characters, whenever they were together, that was magic. It was unbelievably rich. And, and you know, I, I totally agree with what you said about, and I can think of countless examples of shows that, you know, they don't hit their stride until season two. And I would even go so far, you know, with Firefly, like you said, they kind of hit their stride, you know, from the word go. But my favorite episode has to be The Message, which I believe was the last one that was filmed and with the funeral scene at the end. Just amazing and, and your score there is is amazing and it's just it it was hard for me because i only watched this show a few years ago i obviously didn't watch it when it was first on because i was a lot i was a lot younger but i remember watching that and thinking how the hell did this get canceled so i, I have to imagine in your position you know you had to be absolutely absolutely shocked again again i you know we hope for the best by the time you know they they made 15 episodes i think counting the two-hour pilot as two episodes They finally aired the two-hour pilot. They aired it on a Friday before Christmas when everybody was leaving town. Right. (laughs) Here, You know, Fox had the World Series even back then, so they started airing Firefly. They showed one or two episodes, and they said, by the way, we're taking off for the World Series, so we'll see you in a few weeks. Jeez. They put it on on Friday night. Nobody is at home on Friday night except kids who are too young to drive. Right. Everything that you could do to destroy it they did and yet it has lived beyond anything else they had on the air yeah it's a it's utterly amazing imagine what could have happened a, a colossal mistake it, it's un- <laughs> when i no looked doubt. at the two-hour pilot you know my my life is always going from gig to gig because that's 
what happens. Every now and then you work on something that lasts a long time. I was one of the three that, you know, did uh, King of the Hill. Well, that lasted 12 years. That's delightful. Right. But I looked at the pilot on Firefly and I said, man, I am working for 10 years, 10 years before I have to go get another gig. Yay. Right. <laughs> little, little did I know it was going to be closer to 10 episodes. So the last one I did was the exactly the one you talked about, the message. And th that last scene was my opportunity to say goodbye to the show that I so loved. And it comes through. It really does. Does it really? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and, and you can tell, I don't think it's just it's just your work either. I think it's the work of the cast. I mean, watching that scene, the funeral in the snow, like, I don't know at that point if all the actors knew, if, if Joss knew, if, if you knew, but... No, nobody knew. It just feels that way, I guess. But Nobody knew, but I looked at that and I said, here's an opportunity to write music because you got all the cast in one place and they're not talking. Thank you. Right. Yeah. They're just so looking. You have voiceover, but you don't have them having a conversation that you have to stay out of the way of. So you can do something a little bit different. And again, for me, it was an opportunity to, I, I guess I did know the show was canceled because I, I knew I was saying goodbye to them. The, the schedule on Firefly was ridiculous. And they told me, they said, when we get to the second half of the season, we'll give you more time. I pretty much had four days to, to score it. Man, that's nuts. As I was do, using, you know, individual instruments, I couldn't score it all. at King of the Hill, I scored it all at once. Here, I had to have individual players come over, and that's very time-consuming. Right, right. So they said, once we get to the second part of the season, we'll give you more time. But, well, we never got there. So it was just it was just a crunch. But, you know, when I finally knew it was canceled, I, I just everybody else, you know, the editors, everybody else had uh, had already processed the information and they were on hiatus. It was just the post-production guys, me right. and the effects and, uh, you know, all those guys <laughs> bringing up the, the, the tail end. And I just remember being in Joss's office and, you know, tears just came because I knew I'd, I'd have move on to another gig, but it wasn't going to be the same gig because there really wasn't anything in television like that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it wasn't going to be the same gig. Joss was beyond the tear phase and he was just pissed. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And, and rightly so. If uh, That's just how that worked out. But but it was a goofy thing, and Fox just hated it from the beginning. And, you, you know, there's a weird thing in TV. You get promoted even if you fail utterly, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's just a TV thing. I don't know if you remember there was a show called Married with Children. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. And, yeah, Christine Applegate, I forget the, what, the name of it. Was it Kelly? Was that her name? I can't remember in the show. But she gets invited to a stupid party where everybody's supposed to invite the stupidest person they know. So Bud, uh, Bud shows up and he says, Kelly, this is a stupid, a par stupid party. They invited you because you're stupid. And she says, no, that can't be true. And he said, it's true. So she taps on the shoulder of the guy in front of her. She says, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm a television executive. And she said, <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway the people who destroyed firefly went on to bigger and better careers so they got rewarded for their their, their destruction <laughs> it's it's the dilbert principle at work it is here's the way they reason it they go well yeah they failed but at least they know how to run a studio right into the ground yeah i get it but anyway there well you, you you need to promote them so that they they're at a level where they can't ruin anything anymore if only such a thing were possible but <laughs> right it's a goofy world but you know what i'm thrilled that i was a part of that and what a wonderful thing to be a part of but, but both of those franchises have had a shelf life beyond the ordinary I would rather do a project that I really believe in than to do seven others that I don't. And both of those have been great for me. And and I'm thrilled and honored to have been a part of them. So we've already talked about some really incredible franchises, but if you can work on absolutely anything, what's your dream project, past or future, that you could score or rescore? You know, that's impossible. I wouldn't want to rescore anything. And, and I like a thousand different things for a thousand different reasons. Mm -hmm. Anything that is a great story, well told, is fun for me. There are some films that I think are, are just almost perfect. Uh, one of them would be Shawshank Redemption. Love Shawshank mm -hmm. Redemption. Me too. And, you know, usually when people do voiceover, it's because they didn't know how to tell their story. So the story's unclear. 
and they go, we better do a voiceover so people know what's going on. But Morgan Freeman's was completely different. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Shawshank Andy was, Dufresne. That, that, that was almost the perfect film. So I wouldn't want to redo it because it was almost perfect. Yeah, Thomas Newman did a really good job. <laughs> but I would love to do something of that quality. And, and be part of that. You know, there's so many things that I like for different reasons. You know, I used to start off liking certain composers. Now I like a gazillion composers for a gazillion different reasons. It's all just, you know, the certain guy on the certain project. Stylistically, they can all be different. But being part of the storytelling, pro- we're all storytellers. And being part of the storytelling process with people who are just as good at what they do as you hope to be at what you do and just bringing it all together, making something bigger than the sum of its parts. That's what I love to do. And Mm -hmm. that's what I would love to do in the future. So speaking of the future, is there anything that you're working on now that you can tell us about? You know, there's one thing that I can't tell you about because they have non-disclosure agreements mm-hmm. but th- this is kind of a slow time and how you know hollywood has brought yeah COVID is <laughs> right. it kind of kind of slowed that this process down to a crawl so it'll be interesting to see if and when we get back up to running i kind of don't think because the rules right now for filming are very very stringent if you're filming in los angeles mm-hmm. and and some companies are even going out of the uh United States. The uh, the only other big place to really work is Georgia. Uh, yeah. But some some people are going to Europe, you know, to Prague and places like that to film because you, then you're not bound necessarily by SAG after rules. But those are really, really stringent about how many people can be on the set, how many people can right. be in the scene, such that really good actors kind of go, I don't know if we can make good product with these kind of rules. You know, it's hard enough to make good product anyway. Right. right. But to have these rules. So I don't know when we're going to get back to when you can just, you know, may, if, if we have a vaccine, that'd be delightful. You know, so we can just get back to filming for the sake of filming, being bound only by the story, not by all the rules th- th- that are put on top of all that. So it'll be interesting to see. I kind of don't see it coming as a point in time, more as a process where you begin to see things getting better. And finally, you just realize we're back to where we were. Maybe 2022. I don't know. But anyway, so, project wise, that's what I would like to to do. So I've got one that I'm working on, you know, and we'll see what happens with that. But well, we're excited to see whatever that is when we can finally talk about it and hear more of your work. Because I mean, obviously, we've been talking for an hour and everything that you've worked on so far. I mean, has just been absolutely incredible. So I'm sure any future projects, you will bring that same level of just passion and amazing composing skills to whatever it is that you're working on. I really hope to find one in the future. And, you know, you build on everything. Everything you did teaches you. I have yet to do a project, even something I didn't get paid for, where I didn't learn something. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is you just want to continue to bring everything that you learn and then put it on the table for somebody else. And then at some point, I guess at some point you die, you know. (laughs) (laughs) but you hope to find a place to use everything you know all of these things are skills it's the same thing for lighting the same thing for screenwriting and you you just hope to have the opportunity to take everything you learned and use it for somebody else if that makes any sense yep absolutely so before we sign off today there's something that we've been asking all of our interviewees trying to assemble our own little podcast avengers if you will if you can have any superpower what would it be I saw that in your questions, and I thought about it, and I don't have a good answer for you. It's not because I didn't think about it. It's just because at this point in my life, I'm so concerned with being the best me that I can be Mm -hmm. that I don't extrapolate too far beyond that because I'm not even accomplishing that, if you understand my point. So I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I don't know what superpower I would have. I mean, I could Sonic think of a th- I could think of a thousand things to say. I want to be the best person, the best human being that I can be. I think I that think that's qualifies. a pretty good answer. Yeah, I, I think that totally qualifies, and it also is especially unique relative to other answers we've gotten. So I'm perfectly satisfied with that, and I think it's a message for everyone. We can all try and always try and be better. 
Fair enough. So yeah, we're 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 gonna we're gonna wrap up here, but we do of course, you know, want to thank Greg for spending so much time with us, talking to us about the ins and outs of his industry and the work that he's done. Thank you again, Greg. It's been a huge pleasure. It has been an honor. Thank you so much for having me, and I hope our paths cross again in the very near future. Can't wait for that. We're gonna take a quick ad break now, but we'll be back with more news after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Naked Nutrition. Naked Nutrition provides you with pure protein powders and supplements to help you meet your nutrition and fitness goals. Naked Nutrition is completely transparent about their ingredients. That way you know exactly what's going into your body. No additives means your body gets more of what it needs, and I suggest checking out the powdered peanut butter. Mmm, mmm, delicious. Right now you can get 10% off your first purchase at nakednutrition.com by using code P-O-D. That's 10% off using the code P-O-D. P-O-D, for first-time customers. Take your nutrition to the next level with Naked Nutrition. Okay, we're back. Thanks again to Greg, of course, for joining us. Thanks again to our sponsor for sponsoring this episode. And now we're going to talk a little bit about our Patreon support. First of all, some big news. We have a new Patreon subscriber today, Bearded Buddha, gets his first week shout out. Thanks so much to you, Bearded Buddha, for helping us by supporting the show. And of course, we also would be remiss if we did not shout out our fantastic Patreon producer, Mr. Ben Jackness. Ben, thanks again for all that you've done for the show. Uh, you joined us a couple weeks ago, and you've been a stalwart supporter of the show pretty much since the word go. So we, we thank you so much. As a Patreon producer, Ben supports us at the highest level of our Patreon support tree. He is a knight, and as a result, he gets this Patreon shout out. And every episode, he gets input into our weekly game segment. Unfortunately, there will not be a weekly game segment this week, but we'll be back with that next week, of course. And he also gets access to our monthly secret segment and vlog. There is also a Squire level of support, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment and vlog. And of course, the lowly page, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment. So if you want more details on that, you can head over to patreon.com slash online warriors podcast. Thanks again to Ben and thanks again to Bearded Buddha. And now... We can hop into our news for the week. And of course, the big news here is the HBO Max announcement. Now, of course, we talked, I think it was last week, about how Wonder Woman is going straight to HBO Max alongside a, a debut in theaters. So basically, they're, they're releasing concurrently. Well, HBO Max has since announced, or I guess Warner Brothers has since announced, that their entire 2021 lineup of movies is going to be released in the same format, essentially. It's basically simultaneous releases in theaters and on HBO Max, where they will be available for the first month of their release. Now, there are some huge movies here. Like, this is... Guys, this is a huge deal. You have Tom and Jerry, you have Godzilla vs. Kong, Space Jam A New Legacy, Dune, The Matrix 4, Suicide Squad. I think also on the slate right now is Sherlock Holmes 3. I, I suspect that'll be pushed back, but that's a personal big deal for me. I mean, this is this is nuts. So, you know, I guess we can have a, a, a general discussion about what this could mean for already struggling theaters, what this could mean for us, whether this signals a new release format that might stick beyond the time of COVID and whether we think other streaming companies will, will follow suit. I mean, Nerd Bomber, do you see Disney Plus maybe picking this up and running with it? Because that was something that I think we talked about last week. And a lot of people are talking about with this Wonder Woman news. People are wondering if they're going to do the same thing for Black Widow. I mean, I guess it's kind of weird because Disney, obviously they've shown that they're not afraid to premiere movies on Disney Plus. I mean, we've seen Mulan come to the platform, but that had an extra premiere fee. And the thing that's setting HBO Max apart here is that anybody who's a subscriber, you don't have to pay extra. All of this stuff is just available and rolled in. And I know they are premiering Soul on Christmas Day as well, but that seemed more like a one-time thing. They were trying to do like a goodwill thing for people on Christmas. And right. this is the entire 2021 slate of WB movies. And you listed off so many big titles here. And I know for me as an HBO Max subscriber, this is a huge value. And we were actually joking, I know a couple weeks ago, whenever we talked about HBO Max last, how it's really difficult because they're not really on many streaming services at the moment or platforms well, so like Roku. They, they, and they changed that. They fixed that. They finally fixed their licensing agreement or whatever the issue was. So they're on Amazon Fire TV now. So to me, and by the way, that news was more or less concurrent with the Wonder Woman news. So I'm almost wondering now that they have that sorted out. You know, they're saying, okay, now that we're actually, you know, we have boots on the ground everywhere we need to, we need to get our subscriber base out because a lot of people haven't subscribed because they can't, you know, watch on their fire stick. How do we do that? And I don't, I, you know, I don't know if I want to minimize this to a marketing stunt, so to speak, to just supposed to bring subscribers in. But even if that's all it is, it's absolutely going to work. 
Like, there's no way it's not going to work. I was going to say, like, it's difficult because then I have to boot up a console to watch it. Or I did. I, now I don't have to. You don't But I was going to say, yeah. like, this would be something that would make me go the extra mile and not care. One and less remote, right? Stacked on our lap. Honestly, like, I'm so excited about this as a consumer. I think this is a huge boon and a win for me, especially since I get it for free through my cable provider. Right. So for me, I'm basically getting all of these blockbuster movies for free. And it does kind of suck in, in the way that it will probably impact theaters. But I don't know if this is necessarily a bad move. I mean, I know we have a COVID vaccine on the horizon, but I don't know how quickly things are going to change and how quickly people will feel comfortable going to cinemas. And in a lot of the, the recent releases that have come out, I have felt like I missed out because there's really no way to stream any of these cinema only releases. I know like Tenant was a big one that I was just like, well, yeah. I guess I'm just going to get this spoiled now because theaters aren't even open in my it's, state. So it's still not out. It, it's still not out on streaming as far as I understand it. And, and kind of tying back, you know, we talked with Greg in the first first part of this episode a little bit about kind of the, the, the economics of Hollywood and like and, and how studios, you know, often they will do things to keep things in the black and not in the red. And, and you know, I can't imagine. Uh, look, I'm not an economics major. I'm not a Hollywood insider. But like, I can't imagine this is going to make them as much money as, you know, traditional theatrical releases would in normal times. But I don't know. And, you know, I don't know whether it's a move for them to just, you know, stop the bleeding or if it's something they're saying, we're going to try this out. And, you know, we have X and Y projections that suggest this could actually make us the same amount of money or more. I really don't know. You know, I don't even know how much HBO Max is a month because I'm also in your boat where I get it more or less for free. So I don't I don't know. Tactic, you've been you've been quiet over there. I mean, I, I it's hard to discuss in the sense that, like, I think we all think this is an amazing move. But like, do you see it as something that could be successful for warner brothers so in my opinion this is the only move warner brothers is obviously taking a hit with covid and and even if we get a vaccine on the near horizon it's going to be a while before people are just comfortable going to the movie theaters again and since they already own hbo this allows them to maximize their profitability keep the hollywood steam train rolling and also potentially bring in more money in that streaming revenue side. And this is where I'm going to go into diversing their portfolio because <laughs> this now makes them much bigger competitors in the Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus streaming game. Well, it, it's it's all with all these streaming companies, I have to imagine they're just fighting over pieces of one pie, right? And I, again, I would have to imagine Disney Plus... You know, Netflix already has their piece of the pie pretty carved out. They come out with free movies all the time. And a lot of them, not a lot of them, but some of them have very high profile actors involved and they're fr they're free. It's the same sort of situation as you're getting with HBO Max, at least for the first month of release. Disney Plus, in my opinion, needs to respond to this. I don't know whether or not they will. Disney is floundering a little bit in terms of their bottom line. They've laid off a lot of people. They're restructuring, putting a lot more beef into this streaming end of things but if they're going to do that they need to make the streaming end viable and i think there's a lot of people i think we've talked about this before there's a lot of people who don't when we first talked about disney plus coming out we talked about all the content they would have on it. they have all the disney movies they have star wars they have pixar they have marvel like it seems like it's a no-brainer right yeah but and then yet, every contact that they release they put some kind of a dollar sign to it well and yet i mean it's i think it's it's frustrating to that the only new content on there that i think a lot of people are interested in is the mandalorian which yeah. by the way amazing mandalorian again this week but hey, like godmothered came out that was cute not a I blockbuster not by yet. any means but i mean it was something <laughs> but my point is that's exactly the way you're saying it like it's something it's something other than the mandalorian disney plus needs to get out of that rut and they and you know in fairness to them pre-covid they had ways they were planning on doing that they had wandavision they had falcon and winter soldier and they still have those things but they've been delayed they need something that's already in the can to give people a reason to keep subscribing. Because again, I, I don't know the numbers, but I have to imagine their subscriber base dropped off after a lot of people ended their free years that they initially got through various means. I just don't know if Mandalorian is enough to keep people around. So I think Disney Plus, maybe not the entire 2021 slate. I mean, this is a huge move by HBO Max, but like giving people Black Widow for free, harboring more goodwill than just on Christmas, we're going to give you Soul. And, and by the way, is Soul even being given for free? I don't actually know that it is. Yeah, it is. It's included with all Disney Plus memberships. Okay, well, that's a good first step, but it needs to go beyond that. And I, again, I don't know that it has to be all of their products, but I do think Black Widow at this point would be a very logical step in the sense that wonder woman was a step for for hbo max this might also be a response in the sense that they put out the wonder woman news and 
everyone seized on that and was like, oh, awesome. And for all we know, in the past week, you know, this week gap between the two announcements being made, maybe their subscriber base jumped through the roof because people saw it and thought, okay, I'm going to subscribe now. I wonder if some of the reason why Disney is so resistant to the idea, and maybe they're not resistant, maybe they have it in the plans and we just don't know about it yet. But I mean, this decision by WB got huge blowback, especially from the leadership at AMC. I know they they basically denounced this entire plan and said that it was going to be cutting into the survivability right. factor of theaters moving forward. And we've already right. obviously seen theaters get hit really super hard by COVID. But it, I mean, this kind of leads the question to you guys. What do you think the future of the theater industry is? Because Obviously, we see more things. And if this is successful, like this might be extended past 2021, this might be a viable option for movie releases moving forward if they can figure out the profitability factor here. So where do you think that that leads theaters? Do you think we'll see like the demise of the massive cineplexes and more like small theaters pop up? Or like, how do you guys see that kind of playing out? So for me... I, I have a pretty clear vision. I, you know, I, I think that one of two things could happen. I, I think, first of all, either way, I believe the, the full service theaters, like, you know, your smaller, like Alamo draft houses, places that serve you food and, and have this unique experience, those aren't going anywhere. After the pandemic is over, they're going to come back and they're going to be as strong as ever. As, outside of that, I think one of two things will happen. I think you, your AMCs, your Regals, they'll die, I think is one possibility. And as a theater goer, it makes me sad, but, you know, I also have a girlfriend who was thrilled by the HBO Max and who she doesn't like going to theaters because she has a bad back so she can just lay on the couch, you know, it it's better for her. I also think something that needs to be considered though on the other side of the coin, something I've read about is you might see studios themselves start opening theaters instead of these intermediary companies like AMC and Regal. You might see Paramount open a theater and say, okay, this month we're coming out with a movie that would really benefit from the theater experience or, you know, we feel that way for X and Y reasons. It's not just people sitting around talking. It's big explosions, things like that. So we're going to have it here. And they don't need to maintain as rigorous a schedule of like open all the time as multiplexes do. And they can maybe show one movie a month that really, you know, they feel is best showcased in a theater. And that might be where things are heading. That's one possibility. I mean, that's how things were back in the day. I mean, you look at like local theaters and I still have in a few of the villages around the area we live, there are cute little movie theaters where it's a one screen cinema. It's not open all the time. They play one movie a month and that's it. And, you know, they're surviving. They have been. Obviously, it's tough to compete with the big leather comfy chairs and the crazy snacks at a major cineplex. But I mean, they've been surviving and they're always packed. Well, before COVID, at least. I I think what I'm saying is you can have your cake and eat it, too. You can have that kind of a little bit quainter of an experience in that you have this, you know, maybe maybe it's on the thoroughfare in a small town. Maybe it's one screen, but you can still have the amenities and you can have those things because the studio is the one that's backing it. The studio is saying, okay, this is a Paramount theater. We're only going to show Paramount movies. We're going to show one a month and it's going to be on this screen every night at 7 p.m. You can come watch it. I don't, again, I'm not an economist. I don't know whether that's viable, but that's something I've read that that could be one way this is going. And I could see that working. But I don't think companies like AMC and Regal, companies, by the way, that have been barely scraping by mostly on concessions markups of an insane percentage, you know, I don't see them surviving this. But I don't know, Tectic, I don't know if you have a dissenting opinion or if you agree. I just talked a lot. I mean, prior to COVID, we, we, we had this conversation where we believe that the future of the movie theater is going to be these gimmicky things where you, you have your dinner, you watch a movie, and it's got to be more than just popcorn and and a movie right. because it's popcorn one is, is just gotten out of hand in, in cost. And, and I get like why. You do like $20 for a thing of popcorn? <laughs> I get why, because that's where they need to make their money. But it's really got to entice me, especially since your average person now has a 65, 70 inch screen in their living room. Right. And right. a full sound system where back in the day, it wasn't, you know, something that everyone just had. So right. they need to pivot. And, and I think after COVID said and done, that stance is still going to be very much my stance. Right. They, they, they need to pivot. The industry. Need, I, I, I totally agree. The industry, they probably were in desperate need of a pivot before COVID hit. But now it's everything that precipitated that is being aggravated by this. Right. And it's it's the world is more shouting at them than whispering to them. You need to make changes. And if if the latest just the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, is this HBO Max news, so be it. As bottom of the barrel consumers, so to speak, we benefit directly from this. 
it's a matter now, I guess, of seeing how the theater chains react, how other streaming services react, and uh, what we what we get out of it, I guess. But this is huge news. Uh, of, of course, hit us up on Twitter at OW Illegal eighty six at OW Nerbomber at OW Tactic at Online Warriors one is the main show account. Let us know which of these new releases you're most excited to watch on HBO Max if you have it. Let us know if this has swayed you into getting HBO Max. Uh, let us know uh, how cool Greg Edmondson is because that was unbelievable. And just reach out to us. We'd love to chat with you. Right now, we're going to move into our next piece of news. Again, sticking to movies, let's talk about Wonder Woman. And not actually Wonder Woman, let's talk about Gal Gadot. She has been cast to star in Heart of Stone, an inter- international spy thriller from Skydance Media. It's the basic designing principle here, as far as I can tell, is, okay, we want to take 007, Mission Impossible, the spy genre, and put a female spin on it. And we're already seeing a, a hint of that with what's the movie called? Is it like it's called like the three one one or something? The the three five five, I think is what it's called. That kind of female ensemble cast spy thriller that's supposed to come out soon. But this mm-hmm. is, I think they're getting they're getting their James Bond right. They're getting their Ethan Hunt. They're getting Gal Gadot to to really spearhead this thing. And it certainly seems like a reasonable move to me. I think one of the main reasons Wonder Woman was as good as it was is because of the talents of Gal Gadot. And she's got to be one of the more bankable female actresses around who could pull a role like this off, right? Mm -hmm. I totally agree here. I mean, I think she's proven that she can pull off an action role. And I think this is something that people would respond to. And I know there was a lot of, uh, not necessarily blowback, but I know they were considering the next James Bond being a female character and people were not very receptive to that idea because it's already been a well-established character so people were like why don't you just make a new character that is a female spy that we can rally behind and i think this is potentially that and i'm actually pretty excited about this i'm not the biggest action spy movie fan out there see i I am i know that's kind of like your gig and i don't dislike them i go and i see them and i have a good time but like i don't rally around them but I, I've really enjoyed everything that Gal Gadot has been in so far. So I think this could be a really entertaining spin on the spy genre. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, the high water mark is not as much 007 as it is Mission Impossible. Like Fallout was my favorite movie of that year. I think it was 2018 that came out, but I can't actually remember. My favorite movie of that year, it just, again, raised the bar on the spy experience as a whole. If they can take a movie, a, a spy thriller, and, and put a female protagonist as talented as Gal Gadot there and hit that high watermark or or raise it further i mean again it just signals good times for for all of us and as long as it has the quick reaction and adjusting to every situation and especially gadgets you guys know i'm sold right you need gadgets you need gadgets you need you need big set pieces you need exotic locations and when i say exotic locations i don't mean like jungles i mean like mission impossible fallout was actually filmed the script was written based on the look they scouted locations before they wrote the script they found a place that they were like this would be a cool place for a chase scene and they're at a chase scene my money's on the fact that they will have at least one scene where she walks out on the beach with a wetsuit on and then is wearing an impeccable dress under the wetsuit right something like that let's talk about the title really quick heart of stone is her name is her last name stone that's what i'm guessing is going on here I honestly, I don't know enough about this movie. Uh, I mean, other than the writing team, which I'm also very excited by the writing team behind this movie. Did you watch The Old Guard? Yes, we did. It, okay. It, it, like, the Old Guard was good. It could have been better. I think it was hamstrung by the Netflix effect that we've talked about a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, overall, I know like The Old Guard as like the source material was very good. And I don't think it was that bad of a movie. Like for an action movie, I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty serviceable, especially taking the Netflix effect into account. And then Hidden Figures was also super incredible. And to have the two people who helmed those scripts basically writing a, a script for Gal Gadot now, I think that would be, I think that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I still, so yeah, the people we're talking about, by the way, Greg Rucka wrote The Old Guard and Alison Schroeder uh, wrote Hidden Figures. And Hidden Figures is one of those movies I have been told about a million times to see it. I've heard Dude, it's you amazing. need to watch it. It's on Disney still Plus. Haven't done it. Just do it. <laughs> it's on Disney Plus? I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. I did not know that. That drastically raises the chances that I that I watch it, to be honest. But yeah, I, th- this is this is obviously a, a huge get for Skydance Media as well. Uh, big things are expected. This was an eight-figure deal for Gal Gadot. I, I mentioned bank, bankability before. If eight figures isn't bankability, I don't know what is. So we'll be on the lookout for more details regarding Heart of Stone, what the title means among them. But uh, for now, get hyped, fans of Gal Gadot and fans of Spy Thriller. And go watch Hidden Figures if you haven't already. And, yeah, <laughs> and go go watch Hidden Figures. Don't don't be a me. 
I, you, believe me, you don't want that. Rounding out our movie news today, topic number three. I will say, I have never played a single second of Metal Gear Solid. It's a franchise that I just I missed the boat, I guess. But there is going to be a Metal Gear Solid movie. That was something that I believe is has already known. It's it's quoted here by Deadline as a long-awaited Metal Gear Solid adaptation from Sony. They have found their Solid Snake. Solid Snake, of course, being you know the protagonist, the main character in Metal Gear Solid, as I understand it. I don't love this. I will say, Oscar Isaac is too nice. He doesn't to need me. to be. He doesn't need to be nice. He's an actor. It doesn't matter saying, how he is in real life. I'm, he I'm is not going saying in real life. Act. I'm saving. I'm saying even his roles where he's like quote unquote a villain. I'm really talking about uh, Ex Machina where he plays kind of a villainous character. Like he's so genial, you know. And uh, yeah, he is an actor. But like, and I, I don't know much about Solid Snake. But to me, he seems like this gruff, no nonsense kind of guy. And I'm not sure outside of like the the beardedness of oscar isaac i'm not sure i'm there on this yet i am i'm with this i'm absolutely with it but the big question that's out there as far as this movie goes is when it's going to take place so solid snake through all the games his age has varied drastically and in my opinion the snake that should be shown is the older snake i think right oster isaac with his little bit of gray gruff would fit perfectly on his beard salt and pepper look a little salt and pepper yeah absolutely but the one thing that i they, i absolutely absolutely need to see in this movie is him hiding in a cardboard box that has become this synonymous thing with the snake franchise any cosplayer that cosplays a solid snake has a cardboard box to hide in because it's hilariously obvious and it works in the game and it's just fantastic so they need to put that in the film as a little wink wink nudge nudge to the people watching really i didn't Derek, do you often i mean again, i've never played these games are you constantly hiding in cardboard boxes in those games <laughs> well the whole shtick is being stealthy and getting stealth kills and you have an option to hide in cardboard boxes and they've even incorporated it in super smash brothers where you can hit on the d-pad and you'll just hide in the box and sit there and it, it does nothing in that game but it's just funny and just neat i just it's it's synonymous with solid snake like i said i'm honestly i'm kind of surprised illegal that you've never played any of these games before because never metal gear it. solid it literally it like i don't want to say it completely defined the stealth genre but it kind of did stealth can frustrate me though Ste- stealth is for me it's a double-edged sword like i played dishonored and dishonored 2 loved both of them but there is always at least one moment playing those games where i'm like all right i'm done with the stealth thing i'm just gonna it's gonna kill everybody <laughs> like it, i like i clink a bottle or something and i'm like all right well that's it Jim's gonna start shooting and uh, honestly uncharted yeah you know we talked about uncharted a lot with greg has some stealth elements especially later on in the games that would frustrate me because when i play uncharted i show up to just run and gun essentially but there are scenes that you can go through and choke people out very quietly and uh the last of us a lot of games have stealth elements now and for me it's a huge double-edged sword where i sometimes i'm in the mood for them sometimes i like them a lot especially when i'm successful at them when i'm not they very easily frustrate but you know metal gear solid might be one that's worth picking up for me but it's also a situation where you're too far in now i'm too late yeah i'm I'm, I'm way too late i mean this franchise is at least 20 years old right 30 years old i mean it's i think it it, i want to say it came out in the 80s maybe the 90s but i mean it's been a while 1998 i just looked it up so it's 22 years old i might be a little bit late on that but. i do think i think he is a good fit though i mean there was that interview and a lot of the news sites that I, I read this on he did an interview for triple frontier which was another netflix original movie a while back and when specifically asked like what role he would want to do he, this is the role that he said like he called it out specifically he wanted really? to play snake in metal and a metal gear movie adaptation so i have to think he's got some love for the franchise otherwise you wouldn't say that in an interview. And I mean, even just looking at Triple Frontier, I mean, it's a very militaristic type movie. So I feel like he could fall into the role easily and kind of shed that nice guy persona that you see. Never watched Triple Frontier. Another Did you? I, another <laughs> Netflix <okay>. original effect. <laughs> okay, yeah, fair enough. Say, say, say no more. I, I certainly like Oscar Isaac. I, I hope he succeeds. I think it's interesting. I wonder if the reason he's getting this role is, is someone somewhere picked up on that and thought, if he, if he wants to do it, he'd be a great get for us. Let's go get him. That's the news for the Metal Gear Solid adaptation right now. Oscar Isaac set to star as Solid Snake. So, again, hit us up on Twitter. Let us know what you think of that casting. Whether you think it's a good fit, whether it's a bad one, whether, I don't know, somehow it's neither. I, you, you, you tell us. 
But that rounds out our news for today. We are going to, as I mentioned before, forego the game segment, but we can do a quick round here. What have we been up to in the past week? What's what's currently got us going? And uh, take it take it from there. So, so Tectic, start us off. Kick us off here. What do you got for us this week? So Nerd Bomber and I picked up a co-op game to play together called Haven. And the co-op's kind of janky. You're, you're sharing one screen and um, you're kind of working together on picking all the dialogue options. Like you can't pick different dialogue options. You got to agree on everything. But it's it really kind of plays out just like a cutesy story between this couple on a different planet just trying to get by and repair their spaceship. And I got to say, pretty darn chill. It's it's relaxing. It's something to do with with a friend, preferably your significant other, because there's some like romance, I guess. It focuses um, on their relationship a lot and some sticky moments, and I mean that both literally and figuratively. The dialogue's kind of awkward okay. and quirky, <laughs> but it, it's it's enjoyable and entertaining, and it's, and the world is extensive, and there's a lot of cute animals you could pet. That's my that's my quick review. I'm sure Nerd Bomber loves that that latter aspect. I literally I pet every animal because there's there's an aspect basically you're on you escaped from whatever planet you came from because there was like a matchmaker ordeal thing and you're trying to basically run away to be together. That's the gist of the the game. But there's like this material that you collect that converts all of the animals on this new planet into Flow. like yeah into bad guys so you have to like cure them of their ailment and then they become friendly friendly little creatures you can pet and i pet every single one you can bet on that all right quite the mini review on my end i i don't have much to shout out this week i haven't started a new game yet i do want to shout out a movie that i watched on Net- incidentally a netflix original last night called let it snow i mentioned dash and lily on this podcast i don't know what it is christmasy teenage rom-coms have really just been hitting me right in the right in the feel zone lately i just i've just really been feeling it and uh this was no exception so this movie is based on a book it's actually a compilation of short stories by a number of authors the one you'll recognize is john green of course he's the one that has done fault in our stars paper towns all of those it's a very you know they're all seniors in high school they all kind of convene at this christmas party and along the way various things happen to them they fall in love they have issues falling in love it's it's very love centric but I was a big fan of it. it. It's very, again, it's it's very similar to Dash and Lily. It's effortless viewing. You show up if you want to feel good, and you will feel good. I promise you that. So yeah, sh- shout out to that movie. A, a plus plus, if, if that's what you're into. Uh, we'll round it out with, with Nerd Bomber. So I have two quick things. The first one is I finished the Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War campaign, and I'd like to semi-walk back my early review of it last week and say that it definitely did get better as I played. And I was shocked at the fact that they have multiple endings it's not a completely linear story there is a very pivotal moment that you can choose basically and it affects the ending and their the side missions Ooh. kind of impact the ending monologue if you will but i definitely it had a, a big twisty thing that i don't want to spoil but there was something twisty that made me appreciate the game a lot more than i thought i would so it ended up being really good at the end of it but As I mentioned earlier, we also watched Godmothered, which is a new Disney Plus movie. It came out, I want to say yesterday. So, and we're recording this over the weekend. So it came out on the 4th and it was, it was cute. It was everything that I was hoping to get. I didn't want a serious movie. Like you said, like, so I watched Let It Snow last year and I agree it was very good. And that's the kind of movie that I'm looking for right now. Like, I just want something it's, light yeah, something and Something effortless. Happy. Yeah. Just, I yeah. just want to say it's a Christmas movie like Die Hard's a Christmas movie. It's, it's, o- it's only tangentially connected. Yeah. Yeah, it's like okay. it's set yeah. at Christmas, but not necessarily a Christmas movie. But, Honestly, Let It Snow is the same way, right? I yeah. Mean, it's, it happens to be taking place on Christmas. But anyways, go on. But like it was it was very cute, very good message at the end. I think it was aimed more at adults, which was kind of nice. Like kids obviously can watch it. There was really nothing over I would say like PG-13 maybe at the most. Nothing I think too risque. Yeah, nothing risque at all, but it was just about like realizing what you have and being grateful for what you have and learning to be happy again kind of thing. So it was good. I thought it was cute. There were some funny moments and I liked it. I mean, it, like, like I said, it's not like a hundred percent, but like, for if you want a, a effortless, lightweight, happy Christmassy type movie, tangentially Christmassy, yes, tangentially Christmas, I would say like watch a, it. Yeah, like a Hallmark Christmas movie, right? Exactly. It's a, it's a basic romance that. Well, I mean, I don't know what Godmother is, but again, Let It Snow was a basic romance that just happens to project onto Christmas somewhat nicely, and it it demands very little from you. So totally in the same boat with you on on that. 
So that brings us again, foregoing the quiz today, that brings us to the bottom of the episode here. We want to thank again, Greg Edmondson for being here and for chatting with us for, for as long as he did and giving us so much insight into the industry he works and into the projects he's worked on. Again, it was a milestone for, for us as podcasters, milestone for me as a huge score enthusiast. So we want to thank him again. Thanks again, of course, to our supporters and thanks to all of you for listening. Hopefully you got something out of this. Hopefully we can have you back next week and next month and next year because we have no plans on, on stopping. If you liked what you heard, or if you didn't, you can head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review there. And as I mentioned, you can also hit us up on Twitter, yell at me about having never played Metal Gear Solid, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that brings us uh, to the end here. We're going to keep rolling through December towards Christmas and, and we, we won't be heading anywhere. So we'll talk at y'all next week. Have a good one.